So I brought you a little prize that I gathered and cooked um, late this weekend here. Then there is rutabaga greens. You ever had rutabaga greens? Oh, yes, I have, but it's been a while. It was my first time trying them. When I got rutabaga plants, look, and the greens is just just everywhere. And um, everybody was telling me that you got to have, got to try rutabaga greens. A lot of people said that was their favorite type of greens. And so I harvest me a big old bunch of them and cook a big old pot. And I want you to try them there. Well, thank you. I do appreciate that. I know how you like to. You, get you didn't put any of the roots in there because yours ain't got roots on them yet. No, no, they really hadn't started. The roots hadn't started doing anything yet. But I got more leaves than I know what to do with. It's not quite as spicy as a mustard is. Yeah. Now, my wife, to, to me, they taste just like a green. My wife said she thought they had a little bit of a bitter on the end of them. So she put a little sugar and vinegar in there to cut that, but they just taste like green. Tastes like greens to me now. We've been eating them all our life to somebody that hadn't, maybe, but uh, no, it, they taste good to me. Yeah. It's kind of between a mustard and a turnip, maybe. It, it's definitely different than a mustard or turnip or a collard. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And uh, I didn't have to cook them near as long as I would a collard. They're a little more tender. And uh, Got a little uh, ham bone in there? Yeah. A little ham hop. So these are a little bit wilted because I got them this morning. But that's how big... Well, that's some big old leaves right there. Mm -hmm. And the, the, what's interesting is, whereas I got a little white fly pressure on my other brass, because they really bothered these a whole lot. But, uh, and, and I, don't, I didn't know, I ain't never did this before, I didn't know how much leaf to take off. But I did it kind of like I did collards and kale. Left a few at the top and got these big ones there. Um, they relatively clean. I washed them good. But, uh, man, I think growing rutabag greens is... Now, you strip to... the stalk off of them, right? Yeah, so what I did, I, yeah, I just, in the sink there, I just, like that, and then I just tore them up into little pieces there. <clears throat> Since we talked about collars last week, there have been a lot of people on the Row by Row show talking about collard recipes, and I found that was interesting because everybody's got their little, little different way they cook them, and it was interesting to me to read all the comments and see, it. actually, there was one or two I thought I may want to try. Yeah. So the way I did them is I took that ham hock, I got my, my big pot hot and I put, took my ham hock, put it in there with a little oil and basically kind of sauteed them in there to release some of that, the oil from the ham hock, put a little bacon grease in there and I just boiled them for about um, 30, 45 minutes or so. Anyway, let's say hey to everybody before we get too in depth on these rutabagas. Hello everyone and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. And it's really nice to have you with us tonight. If this is your first time watching our show, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and the bell button below so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you're a frequent viewer of the show, it's always good to have you back. So on this week's show, we don't have any particular topic lined up, but we've got a lot to talk about, a lot going on around here. Um, and then we're going to get to some questions at the end of the show. You going to eat that whole bowl? I'm not. I'm going to eat just another little bit, and then I'm going to... You going to stop? I'm going to stop for just a They kind of got a moorish taste to it. They have got a moorish taste to them. They are really good. I'll this time of the year, when the cool weather hits in, a fellow just craves them some greens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it struck me Sunday morning. The boys have been sick, so we didn't make it to church Sunday morning. And... Uh, I told the wife about 10, 10.30, I said, I'm going to go out there and pick me a mess of these. And I had some smoked pork chops, and she made some cornbread, and that right there is a meal. Speaking of cornbread, for the last week, I have been working diligently trying to perfect me my own recipe. And I've tried probably four or five recipes. I've invited the neighbors over to do a taste testing on there, and I'm real close to having it down pat like I want it. So just cornbread, or you put some other stuff in no, there? No, just cornbread. I'm getting my recipe on my cornbread down to a, just, I'm nailing it. And then I'm going to kind of, I kind of go from there a little bit, but I'm real close to having it where it needs to be. So you talking about from scratch? Not, oh, yeah, not, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Not no jiffy? Corn, no, no cornbread. I'm talking about from scratch. With some cornmeal you ground? Not cornmeal that I ground, but I'm going to. Okay. I'm just protect, you get your recipe perfecting right. everything right okay. now. Okay. Well, you're going to have to bring some. Well, that good cornbread to me is off the chain. It is. I think I'm fixing to quit by lightning bread. Yeah. And just don't make my own cornbread all the time. Yeah. Cornbread I keep. I mean, you, you, I 
fry it up and put it in the you know oven. It stay there a few days. It's fine. Well, we was eating them greens this weekend. I take them. We cut the cornbread in little triangles there. You take them and sop them. If you know what sop means, yeah. sop them in that pot liquor, right. and that's pretty good stuff there. Yeah. See what we else got going on. So um, this weekend I got to drive to Columbus, Mississippi, and South, South Georgia to Columbus, Mississippi. It's a good six hours with a a two year old, a four year old, and a woman. It's probably going to be about eight hours. Yep. Because um, they like to stop. I, I, All three of them got small kidneys, don't they? <laughs> bladders. Bladders. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, it, it'll probably take us eight hours. My brother-in-law is uh, retiring from the uh, military. He's he's put in his 20 or so years, whatever he's had to do. So we're going there for that ceremony. But on the way back, I was looking at the route. And so we'll go through. On the way there, we'll go through Montgomery and then Tuscaloosa and then hit Columbus, Mississippi. On the way back, Tuscaloosa and then Montgomery. And Montgomery is not too far from where our old buddy Jason at Cog Hill Farm lives. And so I got in touch with Jason and um, we're gonna be coming back through early Saturday morning. And uh, we're gonna make a stop by Cog Hill Farms, uh, see all those animals. Hopefully Peaches is getting I hope better. Peaches is better. Peaches had a hard time the last week or so. And um, we may shoot a little video footage there. If there are any questions or anything you'd like us to ask, uh, Jason at Cog Hill, put those in the comments below. We you might know what I'd like to see? Interview. I'd like to see you and him do a dance off. Dance off, yeah. I don't know if I can compete. I thought about that, but uh, he's pretty talented. He's pretty good. He's pretty good. I think he has been. Uh, uh, some of his other videos have alluded the fact that he may have been classically trained at one point. Uh, really? Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, so you ain't dealing with just a regular old redneck girl. <laughs> no, no, no. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. He knows what he's doing. So uh, hopefully we can get some good content. Maybe a little segment for the Row by Row show there with Jason at Cog Hill and. Uh, if you haven't been to his channel, it's really, really fun uh, channel. He, he he does homesteading. He's got chickens, goats, pigs. I think he's even got peacocks. And uh, he's gardening. He just started using drip tape. And uh, he just has fun with it. Oh, he, it's uplifting to watch his videos. Just a super nice guy and his family is always it's fun to watch. And um, so Jason's one of our, our favorite channels to watch. We also... Uh, Deep South Homestead, we've got several other channels that we work with and we kind of watch ourselves. Um, uh, trying to think, the, the Stivers Bunch, there's kind of a new and upcoming channel. I really like watching their channel and um, there's several others out there. So yep. we watch YouTube just as well as we make YouTube. Mm -hmm. As far as our garden update goes, um, I got some more of my own onion transplants in the ground the ones that i grew um, the sweet harvest variety and i got the texas legend variety uh, a row of those put in still waiting on plants from dixondale but I, one thing i did learn this year from planting my first run of my own transplants to these second ones the first run I planted the Savannah Sweet Row, I, I thought I needed to wait a week or so before I popped some 2020-20 to them, and I lost a few plants, and I think that was a little bit of a mistake. So as soon as I planted these others the uh, other day, I went ahead and filled up my injector and shot some juice to them, and they look a lot better uh, than those first ones did. So. Um, well, these I will talk about it a little later on in the question section. But these, these you got to handle things a little bit different when you're growing transplants than you do when they when they small in the transplant tray than you do when you transplant them. I'll cover that later. So anyway, if you're putting <clears throat> onions in the ground, I, yeah, if you're putting transplants in the ground, yeah, I, I would say you know hit them soon. Mm -hmm. It's really no different than people go out and put ten, ten, ten or whatever in the furrow pre-plant, kind of the same. Uh, thought there. So I planted some onions in the bare ground, maybe an onion bed and planted some onion seed. This is my first time trying this. This is the way it was done back. A lot of people still do it this way. Up in Vidalia, Georgia, they grow the majority of their plants in onion beds. Plant the seed, grow them up, plant them real thick, and then pull them. Dixondale does that. So Greg was going to try that. Knowing I was a little bit of a disadvantage because I wasn't going to be able to use any, or I wasn't going to use any pre emergent herbicides. So I planted them, got a good stand, but the weeds pretty much overtook me. 
I do think I'm going to be able to salvage enough to plant me some this weekend. So I'm going to dig it. They, not, they look nice. They just got weeds in them. So I'm just going to dig them up, separate them out, and, uh, and plant me a couple good rows of them this weekend. I think I got the sweet harvest as well. Okay. Good deal. Yeah, yeah. Your weed pressure and your high tunnel there is a little I tried high. something and it didn't work. I thought I had it figured out. And it, sometimes you just have failures and you have to admit them and move on. Yeah. And that's what happened to me. A lot of people have been asking about a brassica update on a lot of the broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and stuff I planted. We saw the rutabagas earlier. They're looking real good. And I'll probably shoot a video next week kind of walking you through that. We've had some successes, and we have some few little failures in one plot there. Uh, we might have got a little too heavy on our uh, amendment there and uh, got the I'll same. tell you what's done the best for me this, this fall is collards. My collards have grown, and they're beautiful, and they've grown like crazy. They've outgrown everything else so far. I've already picked uh, most of my collards once or two times, uh, and the kale as well. That I'm really excited about this Cheers cabbage, though. I've grown cabbage in the past, and it I just make a little head about that size. You know, nothing that's going to blow you away, but it's good eating. But these Cheers cabbage, I'm about to grow some big old basketball sized cabbage. I got a good feeling. I planted me another whole row of cabbage this week. And the reason is because I'm going to make me a big old jug of sauerkraut. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's going to be exciting. I've never done that before. This is going to be my first year. I'm going to try that. I want to talk a little bit about beets. So in one of my uh, plots in the dream garden where I've got some cool weather crops planted, uh, where I think I got a little too much of that chicken manure down. What's interesting is I had some some varieties that just haven't done good in there, and one of them would be the early wonder beet. And it's unusual because I've grown early wonder beet, you know, many, many years, and it's always done well for me. But in this particular spot, it didn't like that, I guess, it was a little too hot, and I didn't get it tilled in well enough. But right beside it, I had a row of the kestrel beets, and man, those are some of the prettiest beets I've ever grown. So it's just interesting how one variety really liked those conditions, another variety absolutely hated it. And we see the same thing with lettuce. As I, I've had that experience this year with our different varieties of lettuce. Sometimes some of them will do well right beside another one, another one not do so well. And then you have a temperature change or different in the climate, and that other one kicks up and does better. Who knows? And we had somebody on the Row by Row group talking about they were having issues with some Detroit dark red beets. And uh, if you have having issues with any of the OP beet varieties out there, like your Early Wonder, your Detroit, you know, some of those that are more readily available, I would definitely recommend trying that Kestrel beet we carry. A lot of the market farmers, a lot of the commercial growers use it. It's a really improved variety. And, uh, and it's been my go-to variety for the last year, so I really, really like the Kestrel. Is that a multi-germ? Yeah, it's multi-germ. It's not multi monogerm. We got the Solo, which is a monogerm right. variety. Um, cover crops. I want to talk about cover crops just a minute. It's past the time, obviously, to plant warm season cover crops, but kind of looking back, gathering my thoughts on this recent... Uh, all this warm weather cover cropping I did. And we've got several good ones on the site. But I think as far as, and I, I won't say built for, I, I, won't, I can't say this for clay soils because I didn't do this in a real clay spot. But as far as really building the organic matter in your soil, I think the ticket is to plant that sorghum sedan grass thick. And then when it gets about two foot tall, you go in there and mow it and just keep mowing it and mowing it. Don't let it get. Now, if you grow it in a big pasture area and you're going to let it be grazed, that's a different story. But if you're growing in a garden, let it get about two foot tall. And then it's easy to go in there and mow. It's not going to choke down your lawnmower. Go in there, mow it at two foot tall. And I've got some where I'm still going to plant more onions that I've mowed five or six times. Keeps coming back. And man, that soil there is just, when I do turn it over to plant them onions, it's just, you can just smell the organic matter there. I had, I had pretty much the same experience. This year, I had two cover crops that outperformed for me. The sorghum sedan grass, and there's no doubt sorghum sedan grass is going to create more biomass than any other, than any other of the summer cover crops that we carry. It's top of the line as far as biomass 
building that organic matter. So another one is Sun Hemp. Sun Hemp did real well for me this year. And also we see that Sun Hemp is being used a lot in commercial situations. So Sun Hemp is the go-to cover, summer cover crop right now. I think you know, coming fad and fad out. But that's what we're seeing right now. A lot of people like this, this sun hip. And it did, did in the sorghum sedan grass was the two winners for me this year. The, the one that I like the sun hemp as well. The sun hemp is going to require a little more heavier piece of equipment. You got to chop it up. You got to chop it up. And you need a, a, a if you're going to let it get real tall, you need a bush hog or you need a rotary mower or, or maybe if a If you do mower. not have a good piece of equipment to, chew it up then you need to cut it down early on yeah about need to waste high at the most before it gets in that woody stage because it will get in that woody stage and it's harder to break down if you got means to chop that up it's no problem if you're limited on your mower and just like my sorghum sedan grass i've been using that little push mower with the mulching deck and uh that way i drop all them clippings right there and just you hear people using grass clippings as mulch in their garden. That's what basically what you're doing at sorghum sedan grass. You're just chopping it and dropping it, and you do that five or six times, and you'd be amazed at, oh, at yeah. what your soil structure looks like. Yeah, sandy soils is what we deal with here, and we're constantly having to deal or thinking about creating that biomass and organic matter for our soils to build up. And clay soils, a little different story, but in our sandy soils, uh, that's a big issue for us. So we're constantly thinking about increasing that biomass in the soil, the uh, biological activity, the microbes and all that, and we do that with these cover crops. And, and on to now the cool season cover crops, which I was a little behind. I just got one planted. We had a video come out on that on Wednesday. I made me a cocktail of tillage radish, Austrian winter pea, and hairy vetch. Okay. That's weird. So uh, I was going for some nitrogen fixation, but I've also got in this particular plot a few patches of that old white clay and uh, hoping the radishes can help do that and also scavenge some nutrients from way down below. We always recommend a tillage radish for hard clay type soils because it, by all means it's the best one out here. But I love to grow up my sandy soils too and I'll tell you the reason why. It's one of the easiest to get rid of, of all the cover crops. When that thing makes that big old radish, you think to yourself, man, it's going to be hard to do. You go in there and chop that stuff up and it decays quick, gets back into your soil. So I love the tillage radish. Now, my favorite cocktail is winter rye mixed with vetch. I think that's the key. Did you the plant some of that this I year? Have, not, not as a cocktail. I'm going to, but not oh. as a cocktail. Yep. I have planted it before, and that's one that seems to perform well for me. I've kept the overhead sprinkler on mine for a couple of days, and uh, mine's already in just a few days starting to germinate. Yep. Uh, my carrots, I had a carrot plant video, was it last week or week beforehand? And this time the carrots have tested my patience and got me worried a little bit. Mm. But mm. because what happened when I planted them, we was good. We was between 75 and 80 in the highs. And then not a couple days after I planted them, we got a pretty good cool spell. We was in the 40s or so. And man, it just slowed that germination time. Usually I can get them up in seven days. Uh, these, I've got some coming up now. My pelleted ones are just start, uh, are a little behind the raw ones. I've noticed that also. And um, so I'm looking at more like a 10 to 14 day germination time on my, and I walked out there every day and I made sure to keep water on it. I run the overhead sprinkler for about 30 minutes right before dark every day. Keep that seabed moist. Then I'll switch to my drip tape once I get them up. Um, but I've been out there every day worrying about it. And and I just, I know what I, I know I can grow carrots, but it, you know, it starts getting into that. After a week that you don't see nothing out there and you pace around and worry about it. And you, I sure hope I don't have to replant all mm -hmm. them. But um, they're coming up, so we're better. Another thing I want to mention is on our website, um, we've got, if you click on our premium garden seeds, you'll see all the categories there, greens, peas, turnips, radishes, whatever. There's also at the very top now, there's a category for all of our All America Selection winners. So there's a little tab there that says AAS winners. AAS, AAS stands for All America Selection. So these are really good varieties that have been kind of nationally recognized. Yeah, what as, happens as here is if you're not familiar with the All American Selection, 
They pick, I don't know how many locations, I'm gonna say about 10 locations through the United States where they do these trial gardens and they try all these different varieties. And they have a committee that goes around and looks at it and they take notes on it and they pick a winner what variety has done better. So it's not like they just test them in the north or the south. They test them in all locations to take the notes and they pick a winner that has done well in all locations there. And these all American selections are trialed and true and it's a great thing to try. If you've never tried some, try them, see how they do for you. They should do well. Uh, we actually have talked, I talked to a couple guys that was on that committee back during the summer when we was in Grand Rapids. And it's a, it's a great program that they're doing. And uh, I believe we're members of that group now. That right, great? yeah, yeah. So if you go on the <clears throat> AAS website and, and some of the varieties we carry, you can also get a link to our page there. So it's linked in both ways. Uh, let's talk about sweet potatoes. Let me grab these here. So I mentioned this on my cover crop video, but I want to show some in a little more detail. Hold that. Uh, somebody on the last video said, I always get you to hold stuff so I can still talk with my mm -hmm. hands. So what we did, we planted Georgia Dits, and we kind of did a hands-off approach this year. We didn't mess with them any. We just growed them in one whole plot there, mowed around the edges to keep it from crawling in the grass. But that way of doing it, I really like. In the past years, I've grown them kind of in the middle of the garden. You have to fight with them, climbing on everything else. Dedicate you a little 20 by 30 spot and plant all sweet potatoes in there. Really did well. Now, I left these in the ground whew, probably 120 days or so. And what I noticed is where my plants were, is I went in there and mowed the vines. Yeah. That's suggested by the Steel Boys. And I could tell where I had sweet potatoes because the soil was a little raised. Now where the where I could tell also where I had planted my plants and then where I had pin taters, the little trailing ones off. Now where I had planted my plants, I think some of those stayed in the ground a little too long. Some of those got kind of big and gnarly and they split. Gnarly. Kind of like that right there. Gnarly. Now but my pin taters, I had a really good crop of pin taters. And they all look really nice and pretty like this guy right here. So that's, a, that's your number one sweet tater. That's right a pin tater? If you don't know what a pin tater is, it's where that vine crawls off over by itself and pins down and makes a potato. So some some years you'll do good with pin taters and some years you won't. So some really good pin taters, and that's a good one. And then some of the other ones, I don't think this was a pin tater. I've never grown, I had quite a few of these round sweet potatoes and i don't know what caused them to be round as opposed to elongated uh, but some of these round ones here and then like we said some of them split and i've never seen this before either they split but then they healed back over oh they find to eat now you couldn't sell them at a farmer's market or no. something like that but they find to eat so we we can still skin that and uh salvage that but it i've never seen them split and heal back over like that uh, well, that was nice, but we end up with a pretty decent crop and I learned a few things as far as the kind of set it and forget it method with sweet potatoes. I, I, that's what I'll be doing in the future. Um, oh, I thought you were saying I had something. In my no, face. I'm just scratching my ass. Um, root beggars got me itching. Got you itching. All right. What else we got here? Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some new varieties for I'm busy right now adding a lot of new varieties for 2020 and just wanted to go through a few. I've got three varieties of melon slash cantaloupe. I've got some, some PMR, powdery mildew resistant cantaloupes. We add lots of new peppers. I've got Tabasco. I've got the little pepperoncini peppers, which are really productive little Greek ones. Pimento peppers. Oh, I love pimentos. Uh, to make some pimento cheese, we've got the cow horn hot pepper, which a lot of people have requested. Got a lot of new pumpkins coming along. We got the Cinderella pumpkin. I've got a really good eating pumpkin called Winter Luxury. A white pumpkin, and we got some jack-o'-lanterns, different sizes of those we're adding. How many varieties would you say we're adding for the springtime? On this list right here, I probably got 80 or so. Could be closer to 100. Um, I've got f at least five or six more um, summer squash, some winter squash like the red curry. We've got one called Amish pie that looks really nice. 
tomatoes everybody's always excited about tomatoes it's one of the favorite crops so we've got some varieties a lot of people requested uh, one called black cream which i know mm -hmm. tom matthews grows that's old heirloom variety if I'm uh, one called celebration one called boxcar willie which a lot of people ask for and another one called arkansas traveler which a lot of people ask for we got lots of new watermelons coming in. Uh, one called Baby Doll, which is a really pretty yellow, bright yellow watermelon. Lots of new beans. People have been asking for a stringless bean, yep. so I got one called Landrist Stringless Bean and lots of other bean varieties. Uh, some more corn, um, some, a super sweet white corn, and then we got a variety called Bodacious, which has been around for a little while. Gourds, we're gonna have gourd seed. We've never grown gourds. Those are fun to oh, grow. Oh, they are. I've grown a lot of gourds in my time. I love growing gourds. Lufa? We can loofah? No, not loofah. Lufa. We got with three different types of gourds, shapes and colors. Then we got a lot more new flowers we're adding. And one big thing is these wildflower mixes mm -hmm. that we're adding. I was kind of involved in that a little bit, wasn't I? Yeah. yeah. And I'm working on getting those yeah. on the site now. But we've got these regional wildflower mixes. We've got one for the northeast southeast the midwest and the western part of the country. i'm super excited about these and i'm gonna plant me a good test plot of them this uh this springtime i just love growing wildflowers everybody's got a little spot in their yard that they're not utilizing and i got a probably an acre beside my house down there that i'm not utilizing i'm gonna scratch me a little spot there and i'm gonna plant me some wildflowers yep so we got those four regional mixes, and then we have what we call a bee attractor yep. mix and a beneficial insect mix. Yeah. So we have six different mixes. If you got a little spot, even a little 10 by 10 spot, you can till it up, stroke these out there, and it makes a nice little perennial plot. That and keeps you know what? These are going to make perfect gifts, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we got that those wildfire mix and several other cut flowers. And then my last page here. Um, a variety, of, a big variety of banana pepper called Lola that we were saw at a trial that was just remember absolutely Lola. big and yep. beautiful. Um, we saw Lola in Cleveland, Ohio. Right. A couple of other varieties of cabbage I had people request and say they were really good. One called Bobcat, one called Stonehead. Uh, to, to, to do what else? And then lastly, a new variety of um, really disease resistant determinant tomato that I'm interested in trying called red snapper. It's supposed to have a really, really good disease package and I've heard a lot of good things about it. So um, lots and lots of new seeds coming down the pipeline there. Speaking of new seeds, we have, um, this, <coughs> this might disappoint a few folks, but we have made the decision to no longer print a catalog. Um, what? Yep. Yeah, so I ran some numbers and... Uh, you need to start running this by me. <laughs> so I ran some numbers and uh, it looks like over 90% of our customers don't really utilize the catalog. Everybody's looking at things online. So we're going to save some paper and uh, save some resources and put those uh, to other places around mm. here so we can continue to provide good products and services for you. So... Uh, if you count on the paper catalog, I do sincerely apologize, but it takes quite a bit of resources to design it and then print it and then mail it. Uh, and it, things, so this is another thing, things change so much. So to give you an example, last year we had a couple of varieties that we put in the catalog that we had crop figures on that we weren't able to get. Things change so much with the seed industry about new exciting varieties that come on that you might not be able to get in that catalog that you get access to and you're able to sell. And you can do it more digital, digitally easier and better for the consumer than you can with the catalog. Right. For instance, if you look at our spring 2019 catalog, now there's tons of stuff we have that aren't in there. And we're always adding new stuff. Uh, so the catalog isn't a great representation of our product line. And it's three months in the making to get that catalog out. Uh, at least so no more catalog there uh everything will be online and if you ever have any problems oh, yeah Pick online up call us. yeah you can give us a call or if you can't find something on the website there's a little chat button there I, I, i'm on there a good bit of the time you can just ask me hey where is this at and i'll be glad to give you a link couple more things though where i planted those cool weather cover crops i had them big old okra plants that were about 
seven, eight foot tall, and I didn't know how I was going to cut them down until I really got out there. And it's getting close to, it's getting to be kind of pruning season around here, and I wanted to mention these. So, folks, we carry these on the site, and these are what we call commercial grade loppers. This is what the cats out in the big apple orchards and stuff use. And this is what I had to use to cut them big old okra stumps that was about this big around. Now I had to, I had to go in there and kind of put the jab on them and squeeze. Yeah. But your regular old cheap pair of loppers wouldn't have been able to handle that. But these guys right here, they're 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 not too heavy. They they feel good in your hands, and man, they are sharp. And they just the best pair of loppers you're going to find out there, USA well, made. Well, you mentioned the handles there. They have aluminum, but it's aircraft-grade aluminum handles on there. It's real sturdy. And then, you see that right there? USA. These things are made in the USA. High-quality carbon steel that you can take apart real easy and sharp if you need to. But this is the ones that the peach growers, the apple growers, and all those guys in the big orchards, this is the one they buy and they use. And there's a reason why because it's the best they are out there. And some people like to go through 10 pair of cheap loppers, or you can get you one good pair that you just gonna last you a lifetime, uh, that you can take care of and keep sharp. And um, those came in handy cutting those okra stumps. Let's get in some questions. All right, let's get in some questions. If we answer your question on the mm. show, send us an email to cussserve at hostools.com with your address and we'll be glad to send you a nice little prize. So our first question here is from Rick Sattler and he says he's got several varieties of onions started in a seed tray, kind of like we did. When should I start to give them some fertilizer? Great show, keep it up. Contrary to what Travis said about transplanting onions and hitting them directly with fertilizer, you want to wait till your onions start to get about an inch, inch and a half tall before you start fertilizing. The reason being is when those roots are real tender and just starting shooting out, you can do a little damage there by with some fertilizer. So you want to let them get about an inch, inch and a half tall before you start. Your first fertilization should be light. And then after that, you can gradually get it heavier and heavier. But to answer the question, wait till they get an inch, inch and a half tall, hit them with a light dose of fertilizer, bump them up, and then you can hit them again, again, and again. I think a good rule of thumb is, and if you've never grown onion uh, from seed, you'll notice when they first emerge from the soil, <coughs> It's not like most plants where you've got those first leaves sticking up. The onion's actually kind of folded over. And then once it grows a little more, it'll kind of pop up like that. Once it, the whole first leaf there pops up, I think you're probably good to yeah, go. Yeah, you can. Once they get up and, get, and start getting some roots out of there, be careful with any plant that you're growing from seedlings. When it first emerges, be careful fertilizing it then. Let it get out there just a little bit, hit it light the first time, and then go after that. Okay. Second question is Sue Mary asked Travis, hey guys, same zone as y'all. Can you give me a short list of vegetables we can grow all winter? So Sue, this isn't a short list by any means. We can actually probably grow more things this time of year than we can uh, in the warm season. But I'll give you my list and I might have missed a few things, but this is what I wrote down here. Broccoli, cauliflower, lettuce, beets, Carrots, cabbage, rutabagas, mustard, turnips, onions, leeks, garlic, shallots, radishes, and pak choy or bok choy. Ooh, I think you covered it all. So there's at least uh, 15 things there. Lots of possibilities if you live down here where we are that you can grow all those throughout the entire winter months. Our next question comes from Scott Johns, and he says, have you ever grown garlic? that you buy from Walmart, breaking it up and planting it that way. I've never done that. I have planted, bought, I have bought seed potatoes one time. I say seed potatoes. I bought potatoes one time from Sam's that had them special and planted those. But I see no reason why you couldn't. You could buy them, bust them up, plant them. Here's the issue with that. 97% of all the garlic sold is the old silver variety. It's the same one you see in all the grocery stores. If you want to do something a little bit different, and there's some wonderful garlic varieties out there that are, are unique and that have a lot better flavor and complex garlics than the old silver one. So you may want to look at some varieties that are out there, some gourmet varieties. I know there's a black one that we know a guy up north of grows. There's a lot of red ones out there. There's a lot of them that have bolder flavors than others. 
experiment with some of these kind if if you're really interested in growing garlic if it's your first time you just want to give it a while try and not spend much money yeah you can do that well to to play devil's advocate here i've heard a lot from some other channels out there and i'm not done a whole dug into this research wise but i've heard that the garlic at the stores they actually spray it with some kind well, of well i've heard that too I've to keep it from uh sprouting i've heard they do potatoes the same way but i didn't have that issue Hmm. So I don't I don't put a lot of stock in that. Okay. All right. All right. And we Michael Moore says on the premium greens mix, do you crop the leaves or you just cut everything and will it grow back? Yeah. So you're, you're doing this a little different than say you would a collard or those rutabagas where I go in and you're you're snapping them off this stalk and that stalk's continuing to grow. With the premium greens mix, or, or if you grow your bed of Totsoy or Mizuna or whatever, you're basically doing just like a, a push mower would do if you ran over the bed, except what I like to do is I just grab me a handful and you just want to kind of cut level with them. Be careful because I have cut myself cutting the greens. But uh, wait till they get about, I don't know, six inches tall or so where you can get a good handful, cut them, throw them in a little basket and just... Don't uh, cut them too close to the ground. Leave your what a good inch and a half, two inches yeah, above the ground. Yeah, yeah, and um, they'll keep coming back. I've gotten up to five cuttings off of some of them before. Um, so yeah, no cropping. You just want to get a good little level cut on there. Good sharp knife helps. Oh yeah. And our last question here comes from Shelly Hinojosa, and she says, "What do you recommend for controlling the?" Colorado potato bug on red or white taters in zone 8A North Texas. Colorado potato bug is the most, is the worst insect that we have to face on potatoes. Uh, it can get in there and it can eat the leaves and, and, and be pretty bad if you let them get out of control. Over the years, a lot of your synthetic insecticides, the, the Colorado potato bug has become resistant to them. Back in the day, we used to use seven dust and they'd just wipe them out. But over the years, it's come to all your pyrethroids, your seven, some of the other things, they build up resistance to those. The two things that still work is neem oil and spinosad. Now, here's the deal. Neem oil works good on the small larva. Neem oil will not work on the large larva or the adults. And you get about a two-day residual out of neem oil. So if you start off hitting them early, neem oil is a fine product to use. But... Later in the season, or if you start seeing some adults or, or large lob out there, you want to switch over to use Spinosad. Spinosad is the best product out there for the large larva and the adults. Of course, you can also rotate it in with your neem oil to get those, you know, early in, early in the larva stage. Spinosad is going to give you 10 to 15 days of residual, somewhere in there. So you got two days with neem oil, 10 to 15 with Spinosad. So there you have it. Rotate both of them. Probably use a little more neem early on. And then later in the season, switch over and just you spin the sad. All right. Thank you all for those questions. And if uh, you guys out there have any questions, uh, anything we talked about earlier, put those in the comments and we'll be glad to answer them on the show. And you can always win a nice little prize if you do so. I got to get back in rutabaggers. You got you hungry again? Hungry. You done worked up another appetite. Yep. And uh, our new studio, a lot of people have been asking. We probably a week or two away so it, i don't know if we'll be in there next week's show but maybe the next week's before christmas maybe even before thanksgiving we'll be in uh the new studio yep and we'll have a nice little table we can do some demonstrations and uh we're really excited about that but thanks for joining us tonight give us a big thumbs up give us a big like a big share if you enjoyed this video and we'll see you next time take care